comrades to the Spectre of Communism podcast. The world was shocked by images of 25-year-olds, U.S. Air Force servicemen, Aaron Bushnell, burning to death outside of the Israeli embassy in Washington. He live-streamed the video of his self-immolation to his Facebook page via his Twitch account, where he said on marching to the embassy... My name is Aaron Bushnell. I am an active duty member of the United States Air Force. I will no longer be complicit in genocide. I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it's not extreme at all. This is what our ruling class has decided will be normal. Now, this has triggered a stir, to say the least, We're going to talk about the reaction both by the capitalist establishments, the United States Army brass and the media in a moment, Um, but more importantly, the reaction that it's provoked from workers and youth and all those who stand in solidarity with Palestine. And to help us talk about uh, Aaron Bushnell's act of extreme protest, but also to talk about the situation as it stands in Gaza, which provoked that act of protest, we have Fred Weston, who is a member of the International Secretariat of the International Marxist Tendency. Fred, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Joe. So I suppose the first thing I should ask, just to set the tone for this discussion, which is very serious, what do you think would lead a young man with his entire life ahead of him to commit such a dramatic and agonizing act in his final moments? Well, I think um, it's tragic that somebody would take their life, destroy their life um, in an act like this. But we can also understand what led to it because any decent human being who watches the TV screens, watches the news channels and observes what is happening every day in Gaza. I mean, the latest was the the children that have literally starved to death, or civilians trying to get a bit of flour, a bit of food, shot at and killed. The thousands and thousands of children, of women, the total destruction of Gaza. And nobody seems to be lifting a finger to doing anything to help them. The only ones who are are ordinary young people, working class people, workers in general around many countries, almost on a weekly basis, sometimes some of them are involved in daily activities, doing some kind of street protest or whatever to try and get something moving to help the people of Palestine. But of course, it's not having any effect because those who decide are the ruling elite, the ruling Zionist um, class in Israel, the military of Israel, and they are determined to completely destroy uh, Gaza. And nobody's doing anything. The American government is not doing anything. On the contrary, it is helping in this. It is financing, it's sending arms, and it's giving uh, backing um, to this war. Um, The same for the European powers. So you can understand why there must be millions and millions of young people who feel extremely frustrated at the fact that this is happening and that there doesn't seem to be an end in sight and there doesn't seem to be anybody in a position of power that is prepared to do something to stop this bloodshed. Um, And so in that context, I can understand why somebody um, moved like Aaron Bushnell, um, desperate uh, to, to, to do something, uh, to try and move consciences, to move the powers that be to do something, would go to the extreme act of uh, committing suicide in this horrendous manner. Um, having said that, of course, I would not uh, want anybody to act like that. And I wish, I wish he hadn't um, gone that way, but had gone on a different road, because there is another way uh, on this question. That's the point. And we'll come to the other road in a moment, but I think that the first thing I wanted to touch on is in the 
reaction by the capitalist press and by the authorities, you see an attempt to launder out the political message of Aaron's act of protest. Uh, the initial headlines said that this was basically a um, mental health crisis. Uh, CNN emphasized the fact that no Israeli embassy staff were harmed. The BBC talked about a bomb disposal team looking at a suspicious vehicle, trying to imply some sort of terroristic intent. Uh, it wasn't until towards the end of the day and a bit later, a few days later, that the papers started admitting to the reasons behind Aaron Bushnell's motive. Um, and in terms of the US government's official response, obviously, they all said that it was a tragic event. Uh, Biden said this was very tragic. The Pentagon said this is very tragic, very unfortunate. But they immediately reasserted, I quote, America's ironclad backing of Israel. Uh, Pentagon spokesperson Pat Ryder said that Washington is committed to the goals it set out at the start of the war, including Israel's right to defend itself. So this, on the one hand, disgusting, hypocritical, cynical refusal to acknowledge immediately the reason that Aaron did this, then also off the back of it, saying that the incredible horrors that have occurred as a result of the actions of the Israeli government and armed forces, backed, armed, supplied, funded by the imperialist governments of the West, all of that that inspired Aaron to do what he did, this tragedy, as they put it, will continue. Yes. That they are ironclad commitments. And it stands in sharp contrast to the public reaction. There was a vigil held in front of the Israeli embassy, attended by 100 people. Uh, that was only the first. A number of vigils popped up throughout the United States in different cities and in Portland, um, in New York, in Times Square. There were veterans groups that symbolically burned their military fatigues and mm -hmm. raised slogans in solidarity with Aaron. I've got some quotes from a friend of Aaron's that I'll come to later that reflect the attitude of even a section of the armed forces that are starting to question or become increasingly disillusioned with the acts of the US army in support of Israel. But I think that something we should underline is that as you say, there's an overwhelming sense of anger and frustration with the images we see on television every day, we see on social media every day of just indescribable horrors wreaked against innocent, unarmed civilians, women and children primarily. And not only does it seem like the powers that be won't do anything, the powers that be stand by Israel and they remain committed to supporting Israel's war on the Palestinians. Um, so I think that it's, it's unsurprising that when the images of Aaron burning, and we should say that as he was dying, he was shouting free Palestine. Those were his last words. It speaks to the fire that burns in the hearts of millions of people around the world, the anger and disgust at the complicity of our ruling classes in the events taking place in Palestine, these war crimes, these acts of ethnic cleansing? Well, you see, it's logical that the mainstream media, that uh, governments, bourgeois politicians in general, should try and play down the meaning of what Aaron Bushnell did. Uh, initially presenting it as a mental health issue. Um, but that doesn't, doesn't remove the problem because you can, you can say that it's a mental health issue. You could say, therefore, that um, the millions of young people protesting on the streets are mentally unbalanced um, because it doesn't fit with the idea of what the bourgeois think should be the way you're behaving in uh, you should behave in this situation not only that but you've got rishi sunak the unelected prime minister of britain saying that these protests which are a democratic right the democratic mm -hmm. right to free speech and assembly are an attack on democracy they're that's a danger right. to democracy that has to be curtailed that's right you see um they try and play it down by saying it's a mental health issue but you see what created that scenario what created 
Aaron Bushnell and mm. his way of thinking towards the end of his life. I don't think it's a mental health issue. It's, it is an act of desperation. It's an act of frustration. It's an attempt to say, almost like, well, life is not worth living when I have to watch every day the suffering of the people uh, in Gaza and other parts of the world, of course. Um, it's like, I want to shake things up somehow. Not having any other powers as an individual, he acted in the way he did. But then you see, uh, the way they reacted initially changed to a acknowledging that it was a tragic event, as they put it, and they understand why they're not really concerned with Aaron Bushnell. What they're concerned with is that they realized from their experts and their observers and the people who inform them of what is going on, that actually there was a huge and widespread sympathy towards Aaron Bushnell by millions of young people around the world, by millions of ordinary people around the world, with enormous sympathy for him, because they probably feel they have the same feeling, that, that this frustration, that something's got, to, uh, something's got to be done. And therefore, like in all situations, the bourgeois will mouth, they'll go through the motions of uh, pretending they're sorry about something, or regretting something, or it's unfortunate, or whatever, because they've got to try at least to maintain some kind of, how do you say it, uh, an, an image of having some humanity about them. Mm. Um, uh, but at the end, of course, they always add on. But of course, we support Israel's right to defend itself, etc., right. etc. Et Defending yourself by killing over 30,000 people. And furthermore, there's, there's 7,000 missing Mm. That means that we're actually getting closer to 40,000. When you combine that with mm. malnutrition and the illnesses that yes. are concurrent with that, you know, diarrhea. They, they're actually industry. saying now that they fear more people could die in the coming period from problems of malnutrition, um, uh, spreading of diseases, um, hepatitis is spreading, um, hu huge numbers of di uh, diarrhea cases uh, far above what is normal lots of different contagious diseases and people could actually end up dying in bigger numbers from that than from the actual direct killing under the uh, bombs um so much as this destruction being in um, in the gaza strip um but you see there's a there's a there's a wider element involved here this war is bringing out the true nature of the system we live in um when a war like that in Gaza can take place and all the major governments line up behind the butcher, i.e. the government of Israel, um, and justifies uh, what is happening. I mean, they, they pretend, they, they, they have crocodile tears over the excessive death toll. How much is excessive? Mm. I mean, always wondering, how many, how many people are acceptable? How many should, have, should it have been 10,000 or 15,000? What, what is the acceptable number of deaths for these people? Um, while at the same time, um, Biden is pushing through more aid, billions of dollars in aid on top of what they already give to Israel, most of it for military purposes. Um, so they're strengthening Israel militarily and they're backing Israel. They're providing the weaponry and, and the political backing. And all the governments of the West are doing this to one degree or another. And at the same time, anybody that dares go on the streets to peacefully protest in support of the Palestinian peoples is criminalized. In, um, in Britain, they're discussing uh, that at this stage, it's just talk, but they're discussing the possibility of changing the law when it comes to the right to demonstrate. Right. In Italy, the Lega is putting forward a bill um, with the aim of actually banning um, pro-Palestine demonstrations. So this in, is um, the formerly the Northern League, so... In Italy, yes. Right they're they're, in, they're Italy. in the government with Meloni. In Germany, there's a brutal clampdown on pro-Palestinian uh, protests. I've heard reports about... Um, immigrants in Germany f actually feel quite threatened by the atmosphere that has existed, i.e. you criminalize anybody that shows sympathy for the Palestinians. In France, we've had the banning of demonstrations on 
several occasions. In Austria, two of our comrades are being dragged before a state courts, Alex and Sonia, yes. for their position or for sharing our official position as an organization on yes. Palestine on completely bogus charges. Solidarity to Alex and Sonia, by the way. The um, situation is still ongoing. I'll post links in the description of where you course. can find out more about that. Well, the statement that they base themselves on actually very clearly states that we do not support the methods of Hamas. It's written black on white. But this shows you that, you know, when it comes to bourgeois law, it's not the truth that matters. It's what they want um, people to think is, um, is in a document. What they object to is the fact that we, as communists, highlight one important element, the need for a mass movement across the Middle East, a mass movement of the Palestinian peoples, a general people's uprising to remove the, um, the oppression of the Israeli military over the Palestinian people. That is what they are really objecting to. Um, and that is why they've got to try and mix together positions um, and try and criminalize anybody that's put for, puts forward that kind of perspective. I think that we should talk about the situation in Gaza, which is becoming more critical by the day. The West Bank as well. There have been a number of killings and attacks in the West Bank by settlers and soldiers. But obviously the bulk of the slaughter is going on in the Gaza Strip. Only a couple of days after Aaron Bushnell killed himself in front of the embassy, over 100 Palestinian civilians were murdered at a food convoy by the Israeli military in the south of Gaza City. First, the Israelis tried to say, no, no, this was caused by a stampede. It was mm -hmm. people panicking. I saw one Israeli commentator claiming that a possible Hamas gunman got the crowd whipped into a panic frenzy and that tragically caused the deaths. But now, of course, reports have come out that the bodies are riddled with bullets from rifles uh, wielded by the Israeli military. So not only are people being bombed and starved to death, but if they try to receive aid, they're shot at. And we should be fair, the US government, in its uh, immense humanitarian capacity, has airdropped uh, a few thousand food packets across Gaza, apparently full of expired food. So thank yeah. you very much, Genocide Joe. Much appreciated. Literally within hours, literally at the same time that these reptiles in government were talking about how it's very sad, very tragic that Bushnell did what he did, they were continuing to support the regime that does this, that yes. precisely inspired this drastic act by this, um, by this young man. But can we talk a little bit more in detail about the current state of play in Palestine, because you've written a few articles recently. Again, I'll put links in the uh, description to the episode. Just how bad have things become? Well, how how bad have they become? Um, when you have three quarters of the population of Gaza massed around the city of Rafa, uh, some of them living on the beaches um, and in, in, in huge tent uh, sites um, with nowhere else to go. Netanyahu was offered them to go back north, which is um, the height of cynicism. There's nothing well, left up north. Yeah. Everything's been destroyed. The, the infrastructure is destroyed. The sewage system is not working. The water supply is not, it's not available. You cannot live in any minimal civilized manner in those areas which have been destroyed. Um, so Netanyahu nicely offered them either the beaches on which people have been killed mm -hmm. because they fired at them from, from the sea or back north where you have unexploded um, uh, bombs and missiles and, and, and nothing that allows for, for, for a decent life. Um, they're trapped with, their, war, with their, their, their backs against the wall of the Egyptian border. Um, in these conditions, we also have to highlight the, 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 what's happening in the north where there's at least 300,000 Palestinians still living in the north in atrocious conditions. No aid or very little aid is, get, is getting through. Mm. Um, one of the reasons for that is that Israel is not allowing 
uh, a lot of the aid to come through is not creating secure conditions in which the aid can come through. Um, I was reading uh, some reports which list actually some of the goods which are being held up at the border because they have all kinds of bureaucratic excuses to hold back a truck. Um, anesthetics, oxygen cylinders, um, sleeping bags, um, this kind of stuff. Um, how that can be interpreted as uh, something that Hamas can use in the war against Israel is, is, is anyone's guess. And of course, a series of Western governments unilaterally pulled their support for That's UNRWA, right. the this, U- this, UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. That's right. Un- UNRWA, in effect, if you consider the Palestinian people, uh, not just in Gaza and the West Bank, but in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, living in numerous refugee camps, are, in effect, a stateless people. They have no state to provide the services they require. Therefore, UNRWA, the um, Palestinian refugee, the UN agency that um, provides aid, um, is actually substituting itself for what the state services should, should be provided, mean, what services that should be provided by a state, such as uh, they, pr- they provide schools for over half a million children. They provide health centers. They provide food and aid. They have nearly 6 million Palestinians registered as refugees um, with them. Um, Israel accused UNRWA of having amongst its employees a dozen uh, individuals who are allegedly uh, supposed to have um, collaborated in the attack of September 7th of October. To this date, no major newspaper that I've read, from the Washington Post to many others, has stated that there's proof. They all said, we cannot verify. There has not been any proof. The head of UNRWA has said, none of the allegations have been backed up with any concrete evidence. Um, nonetheless, and some of those listed are actually already dead, Nonetheless, the handful that remained were um, uh, dismissed from their jobs. Now, UNRWA employs 30,000 people spread around the various uh, Palestinian refugee camps, 13,000 of these in, um, in, uh, in Gaza. In Gaza, they are literally feeding the people. Um, but on the back of Israel's accusations, they have... Um, suspended payments. The biggest donor is the United States, but the UK has done it, Italy has done it, and many other countries have done it. Um, Something like 70% of the funding has been cut. Now, this literally means they're saying this month, if the funding doesn't arrive, they're going to have to close schools, clinics, health centers. Uh, They're not going to be able to pay the wages of the the people who work for UNRWA. It means a collapse in basic services for Palestinian people. The Palestinians living in Lebanon, there's about 400,000 of them, are looking at a desperate situation now. What are they going to do? I've read interviews with children who say, what happens to us? What's going to happen to our school? Um, Now, one of the commentators was saying that this leaves the children with the option of either looking for some kind of work in desperation to survive, turning to drugs, or turning and looking for guns. Um, They're basically uh, massively increasing the potential, not to solve the conflict between the two peoples, but to massively enrage the Palestinian people and basically a recruitment ground for more fighters. So even the Zionists are living in 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 a dream world if they think that with this massive pummeling of Gaza, they're going to solve um, the Palestinian um, question. But it really brings out the hypocrisy of imperialism. Uh, Biden is pushing through an aid package for Israel. I think it's about $14 billion. Most of it would be for military purposes. A very, very small amount for humanitarian purposes, but with the specific proviso that none of this money um, should go... um, to Gaza or to UNRWA. Um, they're cutting the lifeline to, to this aid agency. But it's not just UNRWA. 
The World Food Program has stopped delivering food to northern Gaza because it's not safe. Now, going to that incident, the flower uh, uh, massacre, as they call it, um, over 100 people killed. Of course, they, every time, it, it makes you sick. It sickens you to the, the nauseating way in which they repeat it. Every time civilians are killed in a hospital, on a street, in a shelter, or in this case, tr desperately trying to get food, the reply of the IDF is, first of all, to deny that they were responsible, but secondly, they're going to investigate. I'm waiting for all the reports of these investigations. Yeah. Well, when when, well, they're when, gonna... will, when will the investigation yeah. into Shireen Abu Akleh's mm. murder? Mm. Be and then, and then they, public, they even example. contradict each other. Even different officials say different things. Some claiming it was just a stampede. Then the, the, one of the military chiefs says, well, we shot at some people who were threatening us, uh, looters. Yeah. I'd like to know how unarmed looters, as they call them, can threaten the heavily armed military. It makes you sound like rather incompetent and cowardly soldiers if you're yes. threatened by an unarmed, mm. starving crowd. It, it is, they are literally terrorizing the Palestinian people. They're terrorizing them on the ground with bombings, with shootings, but they're also starving them. They're destroying the infrastructure. And now they're cutting off the funding they are squeezing the Palestinians on all fronts. There's a military war, but there's also an economic war. There's a strangling of the Palestinian people. Talk about the West Bank. There are 200,000 people on the West Bank who've lost their jobs. Unemployment on the West Bank has doubled since October from about 25% to close to 50%. A quarter of the um, Palestinian workforce in the West Bank was uh, working in Israel through work permits. Over 100,000 of them were working on Israeli uh, building sites. They may, not like, they, may not, they may not like the Palestinian people. They may um, have a project of um, taking the whole of Palestine. They're very happy to exploit Palestinian labor when it comes to building sites and, and um, construction sites. Um, those workers have lost their jobs. Now, the social and economic conditions in the West Bank are uh, becoming critical. The, the, the Palestinian economy as a whole has contracted by 35%. There's massive unemployment, massive poverty, huge numbers of people not getting their wages. Even those workers that work for the Palestinian Authority, the public sector workers, teachers, doctors, cleaners, etc., are not are, are getting w massive wage cuts, and some of them have got a backlog of wages because... The funding isn't, isn't coming. And just a little detail here. We shouldn't forget that the tax revenues, most of the tax revenues for the Palestinian territories are collected by Israel. This is an agreement made 30 years ago, back in 94. Because Israel controls the borders, it controls the money coming in and out, and therefore the deal was made. They would collect the taxes and then hand them over to the Palestinian Authority. About two-thirds of the tax revenues of the Palestinians are collected by Israel, and they control that money. And recently, they actually suspended some of these payments um, because specifically with the idea no money must go to, um, to Gaza. That means no money for the doctors, for the nurses, who are already suffering terribly in Gaza. So this is a war on many fronts. And on this side of the war, there's also the collaboration of the imperialists, because how do you explain America cutting its funding? How do you explain the United Kingdom cutting its funding? How quickly they moved on the basis of an accusation that a dozen of UNRWA um, employees, apparently, according to the Israelis, somehow collaborated in the 7th of October. Very, very quickly, they cut off um, uh, the funding. That means that there is a conscious policy mm. of squeezing the Palestinian people. And by contrast, when the highest court in the land, the ICJ, found it at least plausible that Israel was committing genocide in Gaza, not a penny of funding to Israel by these imperialist governments was cut. Can I ask as well, um, Netanyahu incessantly justifies every new act of barbarism by saying that Hamas must release the hostages. There was talk over the last few days that some sort of ceasefire deal or 
at least a short term suspension of hostilities might occur. There might be a swap with some Palestinian prisoners being released and some hostages being released, pause in the fighting. And now it looks like that has run into another roadblock. The Hamas delegation arrived at Egypt for negotiations, but Israel didn't, saying they still want the, the, the hostages. At the minute, a full on attack on Rafa is scheduled for Ramadan. Um, not coincidentally, I feel, deliberate provocation. What is the situation with the hostages? Because it seems to me that if Israel was really committed to getting them back and they expect them to be in Gaza, then strangling, bombing, destroying, starving Gaza probably isn't the most effective way to get them back. Yes. Well, you see, even from a purely, let's say, from pure interests of the Zionist ruling class, um, you would think that if their main concern was the hostages, they would seek any possible deal, even if even if they only got some of them released, like they did last time through the uh, temporary uh, truce they had. You would think they would go for that, and um, a, tem- a, a, tr- a partial release of hostages and some kind of deal with Hamas is not completely ruled out. Um, but they don't go for it because it, sh- it reveals the fact that Netanyahu and his government, they're not concerned about the hostages. What they're doing here is continuing with a long-term policy of taking more and more of historical Palestine from the Palestinian people. There is clearly uh, a section in this government, uh, the far right, but Netanyahu is, is completely in line with them at the moment, which is... I'm sure the thinking of some of these people is if we could squeeze some of the Palestinians out of Gaza. Uh, I read one report where they're thinking of, at at the very least, um, concentrating them in the south, um, basically freeing up um, uh, large parts of the northern part of Gaza. Um, And they're even, they had a conference recently uh, in Jerusalem with a lot of important ministers and politicians talking about um, a settlement program for Gaza. They want to do to Gaza what they've done to the West Bank, which is break it up, uh, massive influx of uh, Jewish settlers, a massive military presence of uh, the, the, the IDF, and all, all with the idea that this is the only way they can have uh, security, and basically take more and more land from the Palestinians and destroy, geographically even, um, the expression of any kind of territory where these Palestinians could self-govern. Um, that's the aim of these people. Um, now, the, the the minds are being concentrated, I think, of the, of the, um, the imperialists, the Americans and others, are being concentrated by the impending attack on Rafah. Um, if they go into Rafah and in the present conditions, uh, we have 30,000 dead now. If they went into Rafa, that would more than double um, with with the the concentration of of civilians there. And you could have, uh, the worst case scenario for the imperialists would be a massive spillover of desperate Palestinians from Rafa into Egypt. Egypt is actually building a 16 kilometer, a 16 square kilometer area just across the border, surrounded by a seven meter high, high concrete wall. It, to me, that's like an insurance policy. If the Palestinians do come across, they're going to corral them into this area. It would be one massive um, um, refugee camp. But that would massively destabilize the relations in the Middle East because one of the key, um, you could say, conquests of Israel in the past was the normalization process with Egypt, where they managed to um, end the conflicts. They signed a deal. Um that deal could uh, could be scuppered if the attack goes ahead and if this happens, because the last thing Al Sisi wants is a massive pop- uh, Palestinian refugee population inside Egypt, which would in effect recreate the scenario we had in the Lebanon um, in the eighties. Um, with w- w- imagine what the mood would be, especially of the youth living in these in in such. Um, a refugee camp, extremely angry, extremely bitter. They will have lost relatives, friends, 
mothers, brothers. Everything, really. They've lost their homes for the second or the third time, um, generation after generation of being kicked out of one place and then another. The rage amongst this uh, new generation will be a source of new conflicts. They will organize to fight back, to get back their homeland. This means uh, armed conflicts. This means the prospect of rockets being fired from Egypt into Israel, Israel firing back, and the prospect even of war between Egypt and Israel. That would be a hugely destabilizing factor in the Middle East, but it goes far beyond Egypt. Mm. And we're planning to bring Hamid Aliza Day into an episode soon, possibly as soon as next week, about the dangers and implications of a possible wider conflict in the Middle East. But just to circle back to Aaron Bushnell and to bring this particular episode to a close, um, I did a little bit of reading about Aaron's background. People have been digging into his online activities prior to um, his, his tragic end. And it seems that he joined the military, having previously struggled financially during the pandemic in about 2020, but quickly became extremely disillusioned, rapidly became politicized, that he was an anarchist. And what's very clear is that he was specifically disgusted with, as he felt, his personal responsibility as a member of the military for the terrible atrocities, not just being committed in Gaza, but throughout the world by US imperialism. There's a post from Reddit, which is alleged to be by Aaron Bushnell, where in response to somebody asking whether they should join the military, he said, absolutely not. I've been complicit in the violent domination of the world, and I will never get the blood off my hands. And his final social media post, which has become something of an epitaph, is many of us like to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was alive during slavery or the Jim Crow South or apartheid? What would I do if my country was committing genocide? The answer is you're doing it right now. And I think to the millions of people who, despite lacking the direct means as they see it to put an end to the bloodshed against the Palestinians, doing whatever they can, be it protesting on the streets, be it posting messages of solidarity on social media, even facing arrest and harassment and persecution by the state. You can see why this has captured their imagination. And I just wanted to relate it to the point you were making about the destabilizing impact of the situation in Gaza, because while a war, a wider Middle Eastern war, of course, is always an implicit danger, there's also the potential for a revolutionary explosion. Uh, the one thing that this situation in, in, in Palestine has exposed, it's not just the hypocrisy of the imperialists and the brutality of the Zionists, it's the disgusting two-faced betrayal of the Islamic despotic dictatorships in the region who have not only not lifted a finger to support the Palestinians, but are terrified about the impact of the situation in Gaza on their own populations, who are kept up at night in terror of a new Arab Spring. And we should say that it was the self-immolation of a young Tunisian street vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, in 2010, that was the spark that lit the Arab Spring. Uh, it was an accidental event, if you like, because... There are plenty of, of humiliated and angry and frustrated young people today and then. There are many acts of protest. In fact, Aaron wasn't even the first person in the last few months to have killed himself in this mm -hmm. way. Another person immolated themselves in front of the Israeli embassy in Atlanta. Uh, and during the Vietnam War, a number of U.S. personnel killed themselves in this way in protest. But the point is, the situation is so febrile that there's the danger that any spark could ignite a revolutionary situation in the Middle East and internationally. Um, there's a reason the ruling class here and abroad are terrified of the mood of the masses. It's because everyone is angry. Everyone can see what our rulers stand for and anything could set off the powder keg. Well, the whole of the Middle East is a powder keg. Each individual country, if you look at it, is a powder keg. Um, the, the global crisis of capitalism 
is affecting these countries even more than the advanced capitalist countries in the living conditions, in the poverty, etc. Um, and what we have is reactionary despotic regimes governing over people's suffering, inflation, uh, unemployment, poverty. And while the Palestinian people who are seen as brothers and sisters by the Egyptians, by the Jordanians, by the Syrians, etc., um, are suffering such hell, their own governments do nothing mm. to help the Palestinians. Um, the same governments um, that put down the 2011 movement, for example. For example, in Bahrain. Bahrain, the movement in 2011 was massively um, repressed. We've seen massive street protests in Bahrain, and the people are chanting slogans in support of the Palestinian people and against their own government. In Jordan, we had that massive movement of young people towards the border of Israel. They literally wanted to cross the border to go and help the Palestinians in their plight. They were met with the repressive forces of the Jordanian state, and something like a thousand were uh, arrested. In Egypt, we have um, social uh, tensions developing. Just a week ago, we had this strike at the, the Mahala Spinning Company. I remember before 2011, uh, even before the, the suicide of that poor individual in Tunisia, we were reporting on the growing levels of strikes in Egypt and the Mahala, the El Mahala Spinning Company was one of the centers of the strike movement. Well, just over a week ago, the women of this factory have led a huge strike protest mm. over wages, uh, over jobs. And the women, these women, these Arab women who are often portrayed in the West and media as these uh, timid, uh, conservative, downtrodden, uh, downtrodden backwards. wearing the veil and all mm. the rest of it, these same women show what enormous revolutionary potential they have. They're leading the men, in fact, in the protest. And that's been a recurring feature across that's happened several, the history several times. of it, revolutionary struggle. Um, that's 8th right. of March is coming up soon, International Working Women's Day. That's and right. There's a direct line you can draw to the Russian Revolution, for example. But um, the, the mood in Egypt is uh, one of ferment mm -hmm. and potential class struggle. And if they attack Rafa in the way Netanyahu has planned with the consequences that it will have, this can light uh, a fire across the whole of the Middle East, from Morocco to Iraq. Iraq has had big protests, um, massive street demonstrations for Palestine, but also for their own internal problems. The King of Jordan is usually one of the first guys to um, make a comment about how concerned he is about the situation in Palestine. He's not concerned about the Palestinian people. He's concerned about the spillover into Jordan. Three million of the um, 11 million population of Jordan are Palestinians or of, of Palestinian origin. There's a direct connection there. And the, um, the, the, as I said before, all of these countries are facing um, growing internal uh, movements, protests, the class struggle is 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 brewing in these countries and you could actually see regimes toppling in the next period on the back of mass movements therefore the reason why they're trying to diffuse somewhat the, the crisis brewing over rafa is they're trying to release some of the built-up pressure the steam um it's rather rather than letting this you know the pressure cooker explode open that valve and let some steam out but let's not forget that the Americans are not really pushing for a complete end to this war. Even even the vice president, you don't often see her speak, um, said in the same speech, almost in the same sentence, um, Hamas must be removed completely, um, but we want a ceasefire and we want um, a, 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 res a resolution to this crisis. Well, Netanyahu, if you think about it, he says, well, yeah, I want to remove Hamas too. The only way I can do that is to completely smash everything in Gaza, mm. go into Rafa and destroy everything that's there. He won't succeed, by the way, 
because Hamas is not just an organization, it's also an idea. Um, why, for example, is Hamas growing in influence on the West Bank? You know, while they're trying to destroy Hamas in Gaza, Hamas is actually getting stronger on the West Bank. Why is that? Well, because the people feel defenseless. They want somebody to defend them, them in the face of the settlers and the, and the IDF uh, shooting at Palestinians. 500 were killed last year alone. Um, um, and this is constant and, and, and continuing. This is adding to the social economic conditions and it's, pr it's preparing an, a, an explosive situation on the West Bank. If this, if this all erupts into a huge movement, it could spill over from one country to another. And what we're looking at is, if, in effect, another Arab Spring on the back of the events in Rafah. This is a lot to concentrate the minds of the imperialists. But th th there's one last thing I'd like to say, going back to um, the tragic um, immolation of Aaron Bushnell. There are many, many young people who think the thoughts of Aaron Bushnell. Mm -hmm. When they read his statement, they sympathize with it. They agree with it. They feel it as part of theirs. The thing is this. We should not sit here feeling simply frustrated and angry. We're all angry, obviously. But you see, imperialism is backing the government of Israel in what it's doing. The government of Israel is a bourgeois capitalist government. So is the American. So is the British. So is the French. They have their economic interests, which is the exploitation of the whole planet, the exploitation of the workers of the world, the concentration of profit in the hands of the few. And they will do anything that is necessary to protect these profits. So the people who are allowing Netanyahu to get away with what he's doing are called the government of Egypt, the government of Jordan, the government of um, Tunisia, of Algeria, the government of the UK, of America, of Italy, of Germany, etc. The enemy is the ruling class of all countries. So what we can do concretely and actively today is organize ourselves as genuine revolutionary communists and build a political force aimed at putting an end to the system which has created the nightmare scenario that we're seeing today in Gaza, starting with the overthrow of all the Arab, the reactionary Arab regimes. Can you imagine a workers' Egypt or a workers' Jordan? The position of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza would be very different. Instead of having a regime which actually collaborates with Israel in keeping that border closed, you'd have a regime helping the Palestinian people. And also, from a position of power, imagine the Egyptian working class in power, the Jordanian working class in power. It could say also to the workers inside Israel, you have been fooled by decades by the Zionists that what they've created for you is a safe haven. No, what they've created for you is a country which is in a permanent state of war. This can end in a ceasefire, but we've had many ceasefires, and we're going to have more wars so long as this situation remains. What we need is a socialist federation of workers' states across the Middle East in which there would be room for both the Palestinians and the Jewish um, workers to live in peace together. But that means removing the interests of the ruling elite. That's why we need to struggle again for the genuine ideas of revolutionary communism. Thank you, Fred. And this is exactly the answer that you hinted at earlier to those who ask, if not the drastic and tragic step that Aaron took, then what can be done? And it's precisely that. It's organizing to fight back against the system that created the horrors that inspired Aaron to do the things that he did. I'm going to end with two sets of messages. The first is taken from an article by a friend of Aaron Bushnell's, another soldier who left the military 
because of their political and moral objections to the nature of U.S. imperialism and the crimes he felt in, uh, complicit in. His name's Levi Pierpont. He went to basic training with Aaron Bushnell, and he says that Aaron did not die in vain. He has already inspired so many to stand up for truth and justice. It breaks my heart that his life ended this way. I could never do what he did, and I don't believe anyone should do what he did, but we'll never get him back. All we can do is hear the message he died to shine a spotlight on, the horrors of the genocide in Gaza. And from our point of view, we've been receiving messages from all over the world, as we do every week, from young people, from workers who are increasingly disgusted with the rotten state of capitalist society and want to become organized communists. And I'm making a habit of reading these out uh, at the end of every episode because I think it's always important for people listening, if you're not already a member of the IMT, soon to be the RCI, to know that you're not alone, that there are millions like you, and we are building an organization that we invite you to join that sets as its objective the overthrow of capitalism and the building of socialism and communism in our lifetimes. So this is from a comrade in Marrakesh who says they want to join our organization to be part of the glorious revolution for equality and justice. Thank you very much for that. We have a write-in from Durham, North Carolina in the States, I want to join because I want to help organize a party, join in protests, and help fund a future revolution. I'm learning how to be a communist, and I want to meet more like-minded people. Well, then you need to join the Revolutionary Communists of America, who've been making a bit of a stir uh, with the announcement of their new party. And I've got a message here from Sri Lanka which says, Hello, I am a Marxist, and I would like to work with you to spread Marxist ideology worldwide. I was so excited seeing the demonstration of the Revolutionary Communists of America on February 26th in New York, and I'm so eager for the IMT to shine globally. I want to contribute my own power. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we would very much like to have you in our ranks fighting for revolution and for communism in Colombo, in New York, and throughout the world. And Fred... Thank you, as ever, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And for everyone here at the Spectre of Communism podcast, solidarity with Aaron Bushnell, his friends, family, and comrades, rest in power. Intifada until victory. Revolution until victory. 